Friends and colleagues, it's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be here today. And today I will be talking about calcified instant restenosis. Now we all know that uh, instant restenosis is an angiographically defined entity and we all are familiar with the Mehran classification of instant restenosis, which is basically anatomically driven. So why does a person have instant restenosis? Obviously, there are certain responsible factors. Number one, it could be patient-related, and we all are aware that diabetic patients are notorious for suffering from instant restenosis. It could be lesion-related. We do know that certain lesions are more prone to instant restenosis when we stain them, like complex bifurcation lesions, then long lesions, uh, which has already been alluded to, and multivessel disease. Procedure-related, if we leave a stent fracture, uh, dissection, an underexpanded stent, all of this in the future could lead to instant restenosis. And in fact, instant restenosis has been reclassified recently according uh, to the disease mechanism, and we know that it could be, the underlying cause could be mechanical, like stent fracture, strut fracture, or underexpansion of the stent, or it could be biological reasons, like new intimal hyperplasia, new atherosclerosis without calcification, or new atherosclerosis with calcification, which is known as also a type 2 C type. And it could be mixed causes as well. So when we get an instant restenosis and it's calcified, how do we go about treating it? Well, we first of all need to ascertain the underlying cause for the instant restenosis, and here imaging is so, so valuable. And only when we are sure about what the underlying cause is, how severe it is, can we treat it properly. So if it's a calcified instant restenosis, obviously, first of all, we have to identify it and then do a proper job of preparing the lesion. So how do we go about preparing the lesion? We could use high-pressure NC balloons and short balloons, we should go up to very high pressures. Sometimes we can use two balloons together or a body wire together. The opium balloon can be effective. We can also use special balloons like scoring balloons, angiosculpt, cutting balloons. And for severely calcified vessels, we might need some debulking device like rotational atherectomy. In certain situations, intravascular lithotripsy can be used. And if you have a recurrent history of suffering from instant restenosis, then the better option might be, if required, to go for CABG. And for deciding what modality of treatment to use, intravascular imaging will be invaluable. So once we've prepared the lesion properly by debulking, what do we do next? We obviously have to scaffold that. So for scaffolding, we need drug-eluting stents. But if we think that, no, the lesion is absolutely instant, there's no peristent restenosis, then we can also opt for a drug-eluting balloon, which really works, especially if already the patient has two layers of stent, then a drug-eluting balloon would be really effective the other option might be brachytherapy, which is not widely available, or a bypass surgery. Drug-coated balloons are now in vogue, and I'm really one of a great, I'm a great fan of drug-coated balloons, and they can work wonders, especially if it's a instant restenosis, focal instant restenosis. If you have multiple layers of stent already and you don't want to add another layer of stent there, in case of major side branches and in case of a well-expanded stent, and we've already seen great work about drug-coated balloon from our previous speaker. And so the guidelines tell us that we need to use either a drug-coated balloon or a drug-eluting stent after proper preparation of the lesion, and here imaging can really help us. But if it's a stent strut fra fracture, or if it's already we've used multiple ISR episodes we have, then we should opt for a bypass surgery. So just to briefly go through some calcified uh, lesions, first, this is the history of a 64 four-year-old gentleman, hypertensive and diabetic, who was having severe chest pain for a very long time. 
and his echo was ejection fraction 54 percent. He had a history of undergoing PCI with drug coated uh, stents 12 years back. So this is how his lesions look. You can appreciate that there is, so he had had a stent put from left main to LAD 12 years back, and now we see that there's a 90 to 95 percent instant restenosis involving that stent, as well as the origin of the LAD, as well as the origin of the LCX. So this is a first generation drug eluding stent. 12 years down the road, it is uh, instant restenosis. The RCA stent is still patent, but there was a stent uh, in the PDA as well, which has occluded. So how did we treat this patient? So first of all, we took an EBU 3.5 uh, guide catheter. Uh, we wired both the vessels with uh, run-through floppy wire. And then we wanted to look, uh, have a look about with the intravascular ultrasound, but our intravascular ultrasound, we could not pass it because of the severity of the instant restenosis. So we proceeded to do a balloon dilatation. We took a 2.5 by 12 millimeter balloon, an NC balloon, and we went up to very high pressure. At this point of time, we could take our IVERS and we could see that there was heavy calcification in the site of the instant restenosis. So we did further aggressive uh, instant pre-dilatation. Uh, we took a 3 by 10 NC balloon. Uh, this was a scoring balloon now. We then took a 3.5 by 12 millimeter NC balloon. And for this, we went up to 24 atmosphere. So you really have to prepare your lesion well before you attempt to do anything to put another stand there. We did the pre-dilatation of the origin of the LCX as well, and for this we went, used an NC balloon and went up to 20 atmospheric pressure. We then proceeded uh, to do the steps of the DK crush because the le uh, the stenosis in the LCX required stenting. We felt so we placed a 2.75 by 18 drug eluding stent in the LCX and a 3.5 by 12 millimeter NC balloon from left main to LAD. We deployed our stent in the LCX. We then subsequently crushed our LCX stent after removing the wire and the balloon. We rewired the LCX, did our first kiss. We took our a drug eluding stent, a 3.5 by 18 millimeter drug eluding stent, positioned it from the ostia of the left main. So this was a second generation stent now. We deployed our stent, did proximal optimization, rewired, our st uh, rewired the left main to LCX. We then proceeded to do our final case, did report. And this was the final result. And you can appreciate that the stent struts are very well opposed. There's no underexpansion. And the vessel looked and geographically fine as well. So this next case, this is a 77-year-old male. He had a bypass in 2000. He had been given grafts SVG to LAD, SVG to Ramos, and PDA. A check angiogram was done in 2010 because of progressively worsening angina, and they found that the SVG to LAD was still patent. The SVG uh, to Ramos and SVG to PDA had occluded. So at, in 2010, a cypher stent was deployed in the native vessel left main to Ramos, and he did quite well. And again, in uh, October of 2020, uh, he had chest pain, Angiogram was done in another center, and they found that the SVG to LAD was still patent. However, there was ISR in the left main to ramus vessel. A PCI was attempted in that center, but they could not dilate that heavily calcified ISR. So this is how his vessels look. You can see the native vessel, uh, left main to ramus is there. The stent has the ISR, and it's calcified. Other grafts are occluded. However, his SVG to LAD is still going strong even 20 years down the road, and hats off to the surgeons who did this. So now we have to treat uh, this uh, vessel, and this was done in the previous uh, center where you could see that there is dog boning effect. They could not open this vessel. So this is how the vessel looked. Uh, when we did his angiogram, and you can appreciate the calcification and the ISR in the first generation cipher stent. 
So what we did here, we did rotablation with a 1.5 millimeter burr. After rotabation, this is how the vessel looked. We did pre-dilatation with a 3.5 by 6 millimeter NC balloon. So as I had already said, a very short balloon and you go up to very high pressure. After that, we took a 3 by 26 third generation drug eluding stent, deployed it, did post-dilatation, did proximal optimization with a 4 by 8 millimeter NC balloon, and this was the final result. Now this uh, last case is a very long story. Again, a uh, elderly lady, 75-year-old lady, so hypertensive diabetic with chronic kidney disease, and she uh, had a PCI done with bare metal stents in 2004 to LAD and RCA. Bypass was done in 2008, uh, Lima to LAD, SVG to OM, SVG to PDM. Again, PCI had to be done to the SVG to PDA in 2014. And now she presented with progressively worsening angina. She was hospitalized with non-STEMI. And so we did a check angiogram, and we found that the SVG to OM and PDA grafts are occluded. The lima to distal part of LAD graft is patent. However, the apex region of the LV is there in the LAD has diffusely diseased. So this is, the LCX is totally occluded. The LAD is of a small caliber vessel with 90 to 95 percent lesion, very diffusely diseased. The lima, as I have alluded, uh, you can see that it, there's a graft, but it, the distal to the graft, the vessel is very narrow caliber and very diffusely diseased. So practically, she doesn't have any very good vessels. The RC is calcified, 99% ISR with diffuse disease. You remember she had a bare metal stand in 2004, and then she had her bypass in 2008. So there, there is an early arising PDA, and you can appreciate the angle that it arises. And this also has a severe stenosis, and wiring this PDA will be a challenge, we know. But first of all, we have to tackle the ISR and the heavily calcified RCA. Now, she doesn't have any good uh, vessels, as you can appreciate, so doing this was a bit of a challenge. So we first did rota uh, from, of the entire length, it's diffusely diseased, entire length of the RCA, including the bare metal stent. And uh, first we did with 1.25, then with 1.5, we had to step it up. Now, after uh, rotablation, the, we can see the PLV well, but that very badly angulated PDA, we've managed to lose it. And once that vessel got lost, our patient became unstable, and we had to give her a bit of CPR and all. After this, we uh, managed to open up this PDA uh, with the Conquest Pro wire with the help of a microcatheter. Once we had opened this ve vessel, we were back in business, and now we knew that we had to go for a double stent technique here, and what we did is we knew that we could not afford to lose the wire in the PDA branch. So we decided that we would do upfront double stent technique here, a DK crush, and we would use the RCA to the PDA as our main vessel. So with this in mind, uh, we uh, took a balloon, from RCA to PDA, and we took our stent, a 2.5 uh, by 48 from DES from RCA to PLV. We did our PCI, we used DK crush technique, and this was the final result. So I'll, I've cut down the steps because of, and you, you can see that the RCA is very well visualized, and this is the final result. And here, uh, this, the thing that you see there, that's a rat pad, and whenever we do complex cases, we you always use a rat pad, an extra protection uh, from radiation for us, and that works very well. So this patient is doing well, touch wood, till now, and here we would not have been able to get this kind of results if we had not used the rotor. In uh, conclusion, in very complex calcified ISR cases, we need certain devices like rotablation, IVL, scoring balloons, etc. 
uh, for proper lesion preparation and the treatment options may be a drug coated balloon or a new generation drug coated stent if it's multiple times go or we might opt for CABG and coronary imaging definitely helps us to ascertain what kind of treatment we need and what tools to use. Thank you.